Let's start the next session. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Professor Bill Cleveland. Uh, Professor Cleveland is a Shanti Group uh, Professor in Statistics with a courtesy appointment at the Department of Computer Science here at Purdue. Uh, before uh, Professor Cleveland joined Purdue, he was a distinguished member of the Technical Staff in Statistics Research Department at Bell Labs in Murrayfield, New Jersey. Uh, for 12 years uh, of his work there, he was a uh, department head. Uh, his area of research into the data visualization, computer networking, machine learning, data mining, time series, statistical modeling, visual perception, environmental science, and seasonal adjustments. Pretty much almost anything you can think of. Uh, <laughs> Professor Cleveland uh, won twice the Wilkinson Prize in statistics and once the Huygens Prize. Uh, from the Statistical Journal, uh, Journal of Metrics, is a fellow of the American Statistical Association, the Institute of Mathematical Statistics, and the American Association of the Advancement of Science. Uh, and he's an elected member of the International Statistical Institute. In 1996, he was chosen Statistician of the Year by the Chicago chapter of the American Statistical Association. Uh, I think I've said enough, so I'll let you talk more. Okay, thank well, you so thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. This is a really very exciting event. Uh, so, I'm going to be talking about um, large complex data sets. Well, everybody's got them. Uh, what's happening today? Well, basically they're challenging just about everything we do that involves data analysis. So they're challenging the numeric methods of, of statistics. By the way, can you folks in the back hear me? Okay. Uh, they're challenging numeric methods of statistics and machine learning. They're challenging models from statistics and machine learning. They're challenging visualization methods. They're challenging computational methods. And they're challenging computational environments. By that, I mean the hardware and the software that run the environments we compute on uh, below the application level. So divide and recombine has been developed uh, to meet these challenges. Now there's two goals here. And this is extremely important because this colors the whole solution, what we're trying to do here. Okay, the first thing is that um, we're aspiring to deep analysis. That means comprehensive, detailed analysis that doesn't lose informa important information in the data through inappropriate data reductions. And I'll say more about what I mean about that as we go along. However, achieving deep analysis for a set of data requires both visualization methods and numeric methods of statistics and machine learning throughout the whole analysis. It's just simply not sufficient to visualize a summary. So if the first step in an analysis is a data reduction step, without visualization and careful looking at the data, then there, you, risk, you risk very much uh, losing important information in the data. And we'll, we'll talk about that more. The second thing we want is to be able to analyze data and do methodological development. By the way, when I, I keep saying analyze data, analyze, analyzing data, it's really also about developing new methods for analyzing data. Same idea, same environment, everything is the same. And occasionally I put it in, and sometimes I don't. So the data analyst and the methodologist developing a method, we want to, we want to do this in such a way that, that, that the analyst and the methodologist uh, can work within the confines of an interactive language for data analysis. Yes? What, what do you mean, what do, what do you, uh, mean by an, an analyst? What does that, what does that encompass? What sort of information, what sort of uh, skills that a, an analyst knows about the methods. You know, the, there's only you know, about 3,000 of them. <laughs> is aware of the methods of machine learning and statistics and brings those to bear. Says, oh, this is, I got to use support vector machines here. Oh, no, uh, I, I got to use um, log linear modeling. No, I got to use, you know, and so forth and so on. The list is about 3,000 long or something like that, okay? I'm not talking about 
That's a very good question, because I am not talking about what today goes under the name of data-intensive computing, where people talk about, hey, we're going to be getting, we're getting petabytes now, and soon we'll be getting exabytes, and we've got to pump that data through to something. What tends to happen in that world is they pump it through to, say, a con I mean, I'm not going to say this is not a good thing, but it's not what I'm talking about, OK? They pump it through. You know, They get all this data from across the whole power grid, and you know, the, the petabytes go into a control room this size, and there's all sorts of screens on it, and they have, you know, they're, they're controlling the power grid. That's a very different kind of uh, data computing, OK? OK, but the methodologist and the, and the data analyst, we want to be able to stay within an interactive language for data analysis, like, for example, R. And what's the reason for this? It's because it, it provides very time efficient programming with data and prototyping new methods and models. Now, the, the methodologist is going to have to go on and, you know, once you, I mean, you want to be in the interactive language when you're, you're thinking about and changing a method. Now, of course, the methodologist, as soon as you do that, uh, you have to think about writing in a lower level language. In order to make things run fast, you write your, your brilliant new idea in a C program so that you can, you can get much faster computation. But most, aside from that, you don't want to, for example, be having to you know, program in C to analyze the data. You're trying to avoid that as much as possible because it takes a lot longer, even if you're a crack C programmer. OK, so the interactive language, it provides time efficient programming. And for your question, it also provides access to the thousands of methods of machine learning and statistics. Now, here's the thing. The sheer size isn't really, well, it's not the only problem. Complexity of the data is also a problem. In fact, in a lot of cases, it's really the complexity that's the thing that provides the challenge, the challenge to the computation and the challenge to the methods and all of it. The thing is this, though. With growing size, you know, size and complexity tend to be correlated. So as it gets bigger, oftentimes there's just a lot more structure in the data. That's just an empirical observation. So it might seem like it's the size, but you know, a very, very simple data set with, you know, you're, you, you've got, you know, 20 terabytes of some time series that's basically white noise with a little teeny signal. And all you've got to do is pull that signal out. That can be a lot easier than dealing with 100 gigabytes of data that has a very, very complex structure, you know, with graphs and uh, all sorts of, of complex data structures. So it's not just about terabytes, petabytes, and so forth. Now, in divide and recombine, we do the following. We divide the data into subsets, typically in a number of ways, especially as the data set gets bigger, you tend to have different analysis threads. So there's many ways in which you break up the data. And then you apply each of a collection of methods and models to each subset. And then you bring the results of each method across the subsets back together in some way. And that's a recomb recombination. Now, since I guess just about everybody here is in computer science, you're probably thinking to yourself, well, what the heck? Isn't that just MapReduce? Well, it's, it's, it's well beyond MapReduce for reasons. I mean, we use the MapReduce computational framework, and you will hear about that. But at this level of dividing and recombining, um, we're basically at a level of statistics and machine learning. OK, so DNR research topics um, and the areas that are brought to bear on them are, first of all, methods for division, methods for recombination. So that's all about statistics and machine learning, computational algorithms, computer science, and computational environment. And by that, we mean distributed databases, distributed compute engines, cluster designs, and interactive computer languages. So that's what we, these are the things we have been thinking about. Now, what about outcomes? Well, first of all, one thing to appreciate is that 
sum of the division and recombination that we do enables generally very effective analysis of data, whether it's small or big. And you'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll be talking about that. You'll see that, hopefully, um, uh, uh, as we go along here. So in part, divide and recombine just simply takes what is a good practice in, for small data and extends it to large data. However, there are in, in divide and recombine things, uh, aspects of division and recombination, you do divides just purely for computational reasons because things are too big. So the second, the second thing is that we're really, what are we doing here? I mean, uh, uh, clearly what we're doing is parallelizing the data. So what, what this enables is it enables DNR, or DNR enables the ute. In fact, we can, and we have, uh, been able to use an interactive language for data analysis. It's feasible because the data are parallelized, making computation embarrassingly parallel. And so this can be exploited by a merger of an interactive language and a distributed file system and compute engine running on a cluster. So in the end, what, what's, what's the outcome here? It's DNR makes available to the big data analysis, the large data analyst, almost any existing method from statistics or machine learning, and enables the analysis from within an interactive language. Now I'm going to limit the scope of that to some extent shortly. Um, and I'll talk, I'll talk about more about that in a moment. But anyway, in our experience anyway, I say here typically, typically what we've experienced in the data we've analyzed is that we can actually run numeric methods um, on subsets. And we'll, I mean, in our computations, we'll have numbers of subsets. They're numbers like, you know, 10,000, 14 million um, sizes like that. We find we can run numeric methods um, on all subsets of a division. Now we could, in principle, make 14 million visual displays of subsets, but of course the problem there is who's going to look at 14 million displays? So for visualization, what we do is we'll take a visualization method and apply it to a sample of subsets. So we'll talk about that. But we can do a very good job of sampling because actually we're sampling from data we actually have. So that gives us great power of sampling. It's sort of just like you know, the, you apply the same kind of thinking that you do when you collect data in the first place. You know, I got to go out and get some data. Let me try to take a sample that's representative and covers the bases. Well, we do the same thing here, except that it's a help that we're sampling for things we have. But anyway, this process can be rigorous, and that makes the visualization work at a detailed level. Now, of course, if it turns out that, that you, do, you are in a situation where the computation is too costly, you know, for numeric methods is too costly, you can use that same mechanism uh, for, um, for doing the numeric method as well. So um, right at this point, research in divide and recombine is, uh, is, is quite fertile. There's a lot of things to do. First, there's the methods of division and re recombination. Visualization, how do we use, how do we do the sampling of the subsets? How can we consume and the other thing is, while we say we have to limit it, we'd still like to have as many as possible. So how can we design displays and how can we design viewers so that we can see as many as possible and make the limitation uh, as small as possible? Numeric methods and models. Um, there's both theory and methods to do because we now really have a new kind of theory. It says, all right, look, I'm going to define optimization now subject to the constraint that I must break the data up into you know, S subsets. What now are optimal procedures given, given that? So theory um, and methods. What methods can I come up with that achieve optimization? The third thing, and now I think actually th this, is, this is key, and here's where the caveat is. Data from different fields. How do we bring DNR to each? The data structures differ, the goals differ. Is it the case that you can 
you know, where and where not can you take data and divide it up and analyze it? In which fields? For which data structures? So far, we've been able to do it, but we're only just a few people. So the outcome of that will be extremely interesting. There's enough that, you know, having the subject exist is worthwhile, that's for sure, but how big is it? So anyway, that's about machine learning and statistics, really. It's not about computing. Computational environments, well, this is about computing. So the first is software. So we need that merger of uh, interactive languages and distributed computing. But the hardware is an interesting thing of mice and elephants. We really do need a new cluster architecture. Actually, we need one from, from the standard high performance computing. The tasking is, the computing tasking is very different from what exists today for high performance computing. Um, because the data analysis requires very, very small tasks from within an interactive language, taking milliseconds to a few seconds, where your expectation is you will get an immediate response. And you need one to be able to carry things out. At the same time, you, have the, you can issue a relatively simple command that sends a computation across 14 million subsets across the cluster. So you've got these two radically different kinds of compute tasking that need to go on. And that's really the reason why it calls for a new kind of cluster architecture. And a new way to balance different people using the cluster at the same time. And so we're, we're, uh, we're thinking about that as well. OK, so, so what, um, what are we going to, what am I going to, what are we? Uh, I have two students here. We'll introduce them later. But they'll also be telling you uh, some of the things uh, in here and those things that they're, uh, they're thinking about. Um, Anyway, what are we going to do? Well, well we're going to tell you about one merger, <clears throat> and that's Hrepay. Uh, it's a merger of the R environment for statistics and data analysis and Hadoop. Um, so the, the founder of this was, um, was Saptarshi Guha, but uh, uh, Jeremiah Rounds uh, here at Purdue, Bo Wei Shi, Jin Xia, and actually Jeff too uh, have been, uh, been thinking about and, and um, uh, repay and pushing it further. Um, so we have succeeded in being able to analyze very large data sets staying wholly within R through this mechanism. So, uh, so let me just say, what's R? R is a very widely used open source interactive language. So actually, let me just get an idea here. How many of you have ever put fingers to keyboard and used R? Oh, that's really cool. OK, great. So you know what it is. Not everybody realizes, though, the history of R. R is, well, it started with S, OK, the S language for graphics and data analysis. And S won the ACM Software System Award. I mean, that's the, that's the award in software systems. So, I mean, the next biggest award, I don't even know the name of it. Uh, so you know, things like Unix and uh, the World Wide Web, they're, they're the kinds of things that win this award. So S won this award in 1999. It's because it's a very beautifully and effectively designed language for data analysis. Jeremiah's going to tell you a lot more about these things, but I'll just give you the, a heads up of where, what we're going to do. R is a public domain implementation of the S language. <clears throat> um, it also provides access to thousands of methods and models of statistics. So there, it is run by a consortium. There's a core group, and then there's contributors. So um, there are just unlimited numbers of packages. Hadoop. Hadoop is, um, is a distributed compute engine, MapReduce, and, and um, a file system, the Hadoop distributed file system. Started at Google, became first, uh, the first public, uh, public available implementation was at Yahoo, went off to a bunch of companies. Uh, seem to be working beautifully, and it's now supported by Apache. So you'll hear more about this. 
We're going to talk somewhat about theory and methods of division and, and, and recombination. So Jeff Lee and uh, Jin Xia have been working on this. We have something, you'll hear about things called conditioning variable division, simple replicate division. Uh, we'll be talking about within subset variables, between subset variables, and recombination methods, which we have categorized. Uh, recombination is actually a very general notion, but we've, we're, we've categorized it at this point as being algorithmic, visual, and analytical. We're going to talk about visualization. Uh, I keep saying it's so important, so I, I feel as though we should bring some ideas and methods to you. So we'll, we'll, we'll have some, some visualization in here. However, the key thing, uh, let's see. Yeah, there'll be visualization tools um, we'll discuss somewhat. Um, we're going to talk about a machine learning tool, local learning. And the reason for this is that we're going we're gonna to describe much of what we do we'll describe in the context of an actual uh, uh, large complex data set, uh, measurements of um, voice over IP, uh, in which we were, we were driving to develop a model that could generate voice over IP traffic and look like the real thing and do this for simulation studies. So we use this to, uh, we're going to take one of the analysis threads, there are about five, we will take one and discuss that uh, to illustrate our ideas. And I should say, that, that the DNR really enabled us to analyze this data in far greater detail than anybody's been able to do before. Uh, and that, that really accounted for our being able to achieve what we did achieve in the analysis. And we'll talk about the, uh, a little bit about the cluster environment that we are attempting uh, to build here at Purdue. So one final thing here, I will, I will at some point, I'm going to talk about this notion of the value of learning the patterns in the data, because this is an issue that seems to come up a lot as people think about what's the epistemological path I'm going to follow through the data. Am I going to have a whole lot of automated algorithms and I never have to actually think about the data and the algorithms will just run and everything is fine? Or am I going to have to have human intervention? And if so, well, how much? And how do you balance those things? So I'm going to argue for it being important that one have some understanding, or a pretty good understanding of the patterns in the data, whatever the task. So we will, we will talk about that and hopefully illustrate it as we go along. OK? All right, any uh, thoughts or questions or you know, what's happening here? Or How many of you, uh, okay, let me do another poll. So how many of you have um, experienced Hadoop in a, you know, a direct way? It's running and you're using it. One, two, three. Fewer than, fewer than the R users, okay. Wait, you're in machine learning, not statistics, right? Okay, how many people are, how many people are in a computer, uh, how many people are not in a machine, or a computer science department? Wow. Okay, so, oh, electrical engineering? Ah, okay, all right. <laughs> okay, anybody in statistics? Aha, uh -huh. all right, a few. Good, okay, great. Well, all right, I'll tell you what, I, what I'm going to do is, um, I'm going to see if I can get through this, this local learning procedure, LOAS, because we're going to use it. We're going to use it, and I'd just like to talk about it so you have some idea of you know, what's going on with it. Um, and I think this afternoon, then Jeremy's going to tell you about uh, FreePay and Hadoop and R and how that, well, just uh, some, some broad stuff about that. OK, so I'm going to tell you about local learning. OK, and this really is, I mean, People are, in, you know, this, this is one of those subjects that, that cuts across a number of different disciplines. If you're in statistics, you call it non-parametric regression. And if you're in machine learning, you call it local learning. It's algorithmic in nature. OK. So I'm going to give you a, a, a real simple example so we can get through this quickly. And it's just a um, very small amount of data here. So, so here's, a, here's, a, here's a set of data. 
Babinet point concentration. Um, and our job is to see how the Babinet point depends on concentration. So this is factor response data. So the factor is Babinet point and the response is concentration of particulates in the air. We don't have to worry too much about what they are. Okay. Now actually we're going to take the cube root of concentration. We're going to transform that variable and then do the analysis. So how does, how does Babinet point depend on um, how does that, how does, no, sorry, how does the response depend on the factor? These are interchanged. All right, so a common thing to do when you're, when you're you know, one thing that gets done is that you, uh, you can try to fit a polynomial to data like this to see if you can find something. For example, there's a linear polynomial. So we'd say the observations are a linear function of the x's. So x is the factor, y is the response. And there's random errors, epsilons. And of course, it's nice when they're independent and identically distributed. And then it's even nicer when they're normal, because then you can use least squares. Right? Least squares is justified by normality. It's optimal. If they're close to normal, then it's OK. I mean, no, of course, nothing is ever really normal. It can't be. But if it's well approximated by normal, it's OK. Eh, even if it deviates from normality in various ways, like uh, rounding, then that's not too bad. But there are ways it can deviate where least le squares, that optimality, uh, really becomes the, uh, quite different. It becomes quite, quite bad, especially when you have long-tailed error distributions. OK, but if we say we've got normal variables here, then least squares is optimum. So we can think along those lines. There's two problems with these data, though, as you look at them. First of all, you see that you look at the plot and you say, oh, gosh, those, those things don't look too normal because you've got these massive points that lie sort of down toward where the, wherever the, the curve is going. Uh, there seems to be a massive points here. And then there are a whole bunch that really stick out. So that doesn't, that doesn't look very normally distributed. And also, it's not completely clear what the pattern is in the data. So it looks like things sticking out further than you would expect with a normal. Um, so we don't want to use least squares. We want to use something else. And furthermore, there is a hint in this plot that there's some nonlinearity. But it's a little unclear what the nature of the nonlinearity is. OK. So we could try a, a, we could try a cubic. We could try a, a, um, a cortic. We could try and see what happens when we use polynomials. But the problem with polynomials is they tend to be very, very inflexible. Polynomials don't, don't like curvature that changes locally very, very fast. And if it's changing very, very fast over here, sometimes in order to accommodate it, Way over there, they'll just do absolutely crazy things. So polynomials lack the kind of generality you'd like to have, especially when you're in a mode. And you'll see something about that mode as we go along. But when you're in a mode of trying to explore the data, to explore the patterns in the data, you want something that's a lot more flexible than polynomials. So that's what the local regression does, LOAS. It's a very simple idea. It, we just say, OK, we're going to fit. We're, we're going to actually fit polynomials, except that we're going to fit them locally. And then we're going we're to, uh, over some neighborhood. So if I'm right here, if I'm at a point right here, I'm going to have a neighborhood of points. And then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to fit. Where, where I want to evaluate the curve, I'm going to fit just, just right in the, in the neighborhood of that point. I'll fit a polynomial. I'll fit linear. I'll fit quadratic. I'll fit cubic, whatever. But it's just limited to a, a neighborhood of the points. Now, the neighborhood can get big. Uh, it doesn't necessarily have to be a small neighborhood. It can get bigger. It can get smaller. But this provides, within this context, this this sort of notion of making it local, so it's local learning, provides a very substantial uh, increase in flexibility 
in, in the patterns that can be fitted. So here's how it works. Can, how, is the, how is this in the back? Can you see that reasonably well, or is it okay? All right. Okay, what's the idea here? All right, so here's some points. All right, on a scatter plot. So the circles are the data, and that, that's a data point right there, too. And what we want to do is we want to fit right here. I'm, I'm, going to put a, I'm going to put a curve through the data, and I'm going to use a specific method. But I apply this method every single time I, I, I do an evaluation of that curve. So this, this, is going to, this is going to tell you how I get it at 7.5, the lowest fit. All right, so the first thing you do is to pick a span, which is basically a, a, just the word for um, uh, the fraction of points um, that will be in the neighborhood. So in this case, it's a span of a half. And there's, I guess, 22 points or something like that anyway. Uh, let's say 22. Uh, and so I say, all right, the span is 22. I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is multiply that by the number of points, which is, and I get 11. So, sorry, there's 22 points. The span is a half. Multiply a half times 22, that's 11 points. So I start right at this point, and I move out, and I find the 11th closest point, say right here. So there's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. That's just, I think it's only 10. Yeah, 10. OK, so, I, so it's 20 points. All right, so here's the 20th closest point to this point right here. And so I take the, that, the, the boundary of the neighborhood on this side to be this, and then I go out a, a, the same distance on the other side. So here's the neighborhood. Then I set up a weight function where the weight is a maximum at the center where I want the curve and drops off and comes to zero at the boundaries. So now I have weights. And so what I do is I fit a polynomial, linear, quadratic, whatever, to the data using weighted least squares with these weights. So what's happening is that points that are close to where I want the curve play a large role and that role decreases as you head toward the boundary and eventually becomes zero. And so I fit that line using weighted least squares and then I get one point right here. So that's my first point on this curve. Suppose I want to do an evaluation which happens to be um, x, which happens to be the value of the, the largest x. So I do the same thing. I, count, I start counting here, and I count that point. That counts as 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. So there's a boundary here. The other boundary's off scale. And do the same thing. I set up a weight function, comes down to 0 here. Fit a line using weighted least squares. Evaluate the line at the x, and there's, now I got two points for this curve, OK? And so forth and so on. Now, it's a much more complex story than this, because actually you can take this and fit as a function of more than one variable. And of course, you can't really evaluate it at every place you want to, because if I want to evaluate, say, a, on a grid of 5,000 points, and I try to do this operation every single time independently, well, I could parallelize it, I guess. Uh, but, but still, um, there, there are computational algorithms that can carry this out. And th this, as I described it, is an n squared, order n squared. You can, uh, you can do a lot better than that. Um, so we won't talk about that. Um, so there is a much more complex story underneath it in terms of algorithms. All right, so here's an instance of this. If we take our, um, if we take our our Babinet point uh, concentration data, uh, cube root concentration, and put a curve through it, we get something that looks like this. All right, and here's just some equations. I'm going to skip these. These are just sort of, you know, the, um, the equations that describe what we did. Okay, so 
let's, let's, let's think about the parameters over which you have control. Um, first of all, you pick, um, or something picks, let's put it that way, something picks the degree of the polynomial to be fitted locally. Now one thing, the best way to think about this is that it's not a black box, okay? A lot, actually, a lot of people who have written about this stuff think of it as a black box. Okay, I got this black box, you know, what should be, what's going to be better? You know, quadratic, uh, linear? Well, it's going to depend, I mean, this is going to surprise you, but it depends on the patterns in the data. Um, it's, um, if locally, I mean, suppose I, suppose I have something that goes up to a peak and comes down, okay? And you say, well, hmm, yikes. Um, if I fit, if I do a linear fit, what happens when I get to the peak? Because the neighborhood will be centered on the, on the linear piece, and then, you know, this side is, 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 is less, this side is less. If I, if, I, if I use local linear fitting, I'm actually going to chop that peak because I'm going to get, the fit is going to be a horizontal line. And I, inevitably, I will chop the peak. So I'd better pick quadratic. It's sort of like that. I mean, there's a lot. It, it's, uh, the story, of course, isn't that simple because you can't always, you know, see everything. If you could, then, then it'd be a lot easier. But, you know, the second you get into, you know, fitting as a function of four variables, it gets harder. Um, but still, that's the idea. It is, you really are taking seriously the notion that locally things are well approximated, say, by a quadratic, a cubic, a linear, whatever. Um, <clears throat> so obviously I get more, I get, I get closer and closer fits as the, the degree of the polynomial goes up, so it's, it's fitting more and more. Um, uh, so it's getting, let's say, for a fixed bandwidth, it's getting noisier. Um, <clears throat> furthermore, as the, as the bandwidth increases, I mean, as I take more and more points in my neighborhood, the curve that's fitted gets smoother. So it gets smoother as I decrease the polynomial degree. It gets smoother as I increase the bandwidth. There is a notion of taking the bandwidth to infinity. I know I just said it was a fraction of points, but you can, once you get that fraction to be one, you can extend the definition of the fitting and make it bigger than one. And you're still going to get a, wait, a weighting when you do this of points until finally, when alpha is at infinity, you're getting the least squares fit because everything gets the same weight. So it's getting smoother as alpha increases. Uh, it's getting smoother as lambda decreases. So how are we going to make that choice? I should say up front, there are model selection criteria that can be brought to bear here. OK, so we could stuff this into uh, something like the Akaika um, uh, Model selection criterion, Mallow CP, cross validation, generalized cross validation. There's an extremely long list. Actually, the surprisingly, they're all surprisingly similar because the ideas behind them are really quite, quite similar. Um, okay, so, so what was what was this fit here? Well, it's lambda equals one, so it's local local linear fitting and a neighborhood size of three quarters. I mean, when you look at the plot, you say, yeah, this thing is actually pretty smooth, you know. So I. So you, you may, it's not unreasonable to be thinking in terms of larger values. So there's three quarters. And so we can see, well, some nonlinearity in that fitted curve. OK? But the thing is, we still can't see if the curve fits the data. I mean, we, we couldn't see the curve very well in the first place. So how are we going to judge something? So what do we do in order to help us in terms of um, in terms of uh, visual displays. Okay, well, what we're going to do is we're going to take residuals. So here are the data, xi, yi. So yi fitted as a function of xi. And I'll let g hat of x be, that's going to describe the, the, the lowest fit um, at x. And by the way, keep in mind, it's describing the location of the distribution of yi for xi close to x. So take the, take, the, take the lowest fit, evaluate it at the points in the data, and that gives me a predicted value of yi. I said, well, the predicted value, the expected value of yi at xi, and subtract that from the actual observations. So predicted, subtracted from actual observations, 
and plot those residuals against Xi. And guess what? Put a lowest curve on it. In this case, though, um, let's see. No, this is for what? Sorry. The, in this case, I think it's, uh, where do I say that? Do I say this here? No. Do I say it here? All right. Anyway, it's a, it's a lowest procedure that gives you less smooth results. So the idea is, OK, I already, you know, I, I picked a smoothing parameter of 3 quarters. When I, when I make the plot of the residuals, I'll put a Lewis curve through that so I can see what's going on, try to make an assessment visually. But that's going to, be, that's going to have a smaller bandwidth than the one I fitted with. So what you can see now is that actually over here on the left side of the plot, things aren't fitting too well. In fact, you notice that all the points are less than 0. All right, so that means that the fit is too small. And if you go back and look at the plot, in other words, the fit is below the data. And that makes sense because it is right around here where the curvature starts to change a lot. And what it says is, you know what? You pick too wide a bandwidth because it couldn't accommodate the curvature that's actually in the data. And you can see that clearly here. Okay, so plot up residuals. This, by the way, is an old idea. There's nothing new in this, by the way. This goes back to the 60s, people, when people first started developing um, uh, diagnostic procedures. The first thing that was attacked was, was regression analysis, you know, simple regression analysis, linear regression. Uh, and um, so this was the plotting of residuals um, became a standard in, in regression studies. And of course, it, it applies to a lot of different other kinds of model fits. OK, so it's not too surprising. So you say, well, OK, I'm going to decrease the bandwidth uh, since uh, I didn't get the curvature. And now you take alpha equals a 6. So neighborhood sizes are a 6. And now what you see is, uh, yes, indeed. In fact, it even looks like things are flat here. But I'm certainly overfitting now. I haven't got a level of smoothness that, that makes sense. And if I look at the residuals, I'm sure doing a good job of tracking the data. Um, because look at this residual plot. I'm certainly picking up. Um, the behavior of the data. Um, so I'm doing a good job, but it's at the expense of smoothness of the fitted function, which might be OK for a lot of purposes if you say, well, guess what? I'm only doing, this is only for visual analysis anyway. I'm not going to, I probably won't use this. If you take alpha equals one, uh, uh, lambda equals one, and alpha equals a third, you do better. Now it does a better job of, of this abrupt change in the smoothness. But the fact is, when you look at this, you come up with a fairly obvious conclusion now. And this happens a lot with this kind of you know, very flexible fitting. Or, well, I shouldn't say a lot, but it does happen with this kind of fitting where you say, hey, you know what it looks like? What does it look like? Looks like a, starts with an S. Spline, right. This looks like a spline. It looks like you know, there's a linear piece, uh, which is a constant up into a certain point, and then, then it becomes linear again, but with a negative slope. So this thing needs a spline. And who knows? Maybe I'll start a whole new, whole new track in the, the theory of the physics of, uh, uh, well, atmospheric physics involving sunlight and things like that. So, so anyway, that's what it actually looks like. And so now, it would be entirely appropriate to say, hey, I'm going to fit a spline to these data and quit. So the lowest procedure has done its job. It's pointed the way toward something else. In fact, in a lot of cases, and you'll find with our voice over IP data, you'll see that we actually stick with it. When we're all done, we say, hey, this is working great. Uh, we don't see anything that's terribly simple, so we're going to stick with it. But in this case, we see something that is simpler. OK. Now, What else would we like about this model? Well, we'd actually like it to be the case that those error terms that we have in the model are, have about the same variance. And we know that, well, you know, oftentimes as magnitude of things gets bigger, or, you know, that's, that's a candidate uh, for um, things getting more variable. So how are we going to check whether or not the variability, the spread, actually, Let's use the word spread because 
Variance is a very specific measure of spread of the data, and we could have lots of other measures. But what we're going to do is uh, we want to see if the spread changes with x. So what we'll do is we'll take the absolute residuals, take their square roots, because that tends to, you know, you take the absolute residuals, you have something that's going to be very skewed distribution. Take the square root, it helps to make it symmetric and more amenable to fitting by something. But in any case, you take the square root absolute value, plot it against the x's, and then put a lowest curve on it and take a look at it. And you look at it and you say, oh, it does look like there's a little bit of an increase here. But just a little bit of an increase. And it's hard to convince yourself that this is an actionable increase. You say, you know what? A little bit of change in variance is not going to be a problem. If there's a very substantial change in variance, then I'm going to worry about it. But here, it seems to be fairly minor. And maybe, in fact, actually, if you increase the, if you increase the bandwidth and make it alpha so big that it's linear, it still will be going up a little bit. So you say, OK, all modeling is like this. If I may quote George Box, all models are wrong, but some of them are useful. OK. so. So you have, and by the way, particularly when you get to large amounts of data, I mean, everything is manifestly wrong. Uh, but it's not whether it's right or wrong, because nothing is ever anything, right? Uh, it's how good the approximation is. And here, approximation of a constant variance is just fine, obviously. I didn't actually tell you the whole story. Um, but this is an important part of the story, because the fitting, as I described it, isn't exactly what we did in those pictures. It wasn't just least squares fitting. When, when we saw, by the way, it's just an illustrative example, of course. I mean, this, is, uh, uh, this, this doesn't constitute a real, a, a real analysis. This, kind of, this is something to, to show you the details here. So I mean, when we get to the voice over IP, then it's real. OK. So, um, but on that scatter plot, we did see this evidence of non-normalities, you know, tails sticking out too far. So we say, OK, well, um, I'm going to worry about that, because I know that outliers, if I'm using these squares, I can get into trouble. And especially since you know, if I'm doing this locally, and it doesn't take too many outliers before I start to really mess things up with least squares. So what are we going to do about that? Well. We need another algorithm. And the idea is we need an algorithm that will sort of sense that there are outliers or more pervasively a long-tailed error distribution. So we can use the term outliers, which usually means they're just a relatively small fraction of things sticking way out. But we get the same problem if the tail of the distribution is, is much longer than the normal. It's very pervasive. It's not just a few outliers. It's the whole distribution sticks out too far in the tails. For example, if it's a, a T with three degrees of freedom, um, then you're going to get a tail of that distribution, the whole tail of which sticks out. And, and that will also make render least squares very, very inefficient. And so we say, well, and particularly when I get into high dimensions now, um, when I can't quite see things with as much you know, simplicity as I can when I have just one variable, I need to worry about this somewhat. So, so, so now we're sort of, you know, we're 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 depending on the algorithm uh, to help us out here. So we have another um, we have another thing to do. So here's the idea. What we're going to do is, on top of this, we're going to use something called bi square. And the idea is this. Start with least squares, although the real aficionados of the subject, you know, they say, no, no, don't start with least squares. You can, it'll, you know, it could throw you off so far that you'll never get to the right solution. You know, but anyway, so, but, you know, moderation in all things. Let's start with least squares. Um, and, and what we do is we, take the, we do the least squares fit, and then we get the residuals. And you look at the residuals, and you downweight them by their magnitude. So residuals far from the center will get a larger weight, you know, residuals close to zero will get a, a high weight, and residuals far away from zero will get a smaller weight until finally um, the weights go to zero. Okay? And then we take those weights and we redo the fitting 
with weighted least squares. All right. This is a very general method. This can be used for lots of, uh, lots of factor response analysis. Yeah? There must be other ways to optimize this. Why do you use the same one? You mean with bi square? Oh, oh, it, well, yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's just, it's just a way. But is there anything optimal about it or just? Um, certainly not anything optimal. In fact, in this, in this particular case, there isn't even a guarantee of convergence. So, although I suppose, uh, you know, it's funny because convergence are one of those things where you say, yeah, come on, or you prove that it converges well, but there's no such thing as, you know, absolute guarantees of convergence, right? So, because something gets so slow, it looks like it's converged, but it hasn't actually, if it's very flat. So, no, it's just a way, nothing, nothing particular, well, oh, actually, sorry. We, we can, uh, actually, I can put a little bit of optimality, or at least get in that direction. If you say I've got a T distribution with three degrees of freedom, and I'm going to do maximum likelihood. Now, we, I mean, uh, optimality would be a little bit too strong, but it's, it's, a, a, it's a very good thing to do. You know, I have t-distribution, I'll now use maximum likelihood. Maximum likelihood can be thought of as, or an algorithm you can actually use is reweighted least squares like this, where you actually look at the residuals and use a weight function to downweight them except that the t has its weight function, the t with three degrees of freedom. The t with 10 degrees of freedom would have a weight function. So it varies with the distribution. So we're sort of in the, at least we're in the ballpark. We have picked a weight function, and it's going to be reweighting just the way the t would. It's just the weight function is different. And the idea is to try to pick something that will, will do well across a lot of dif different distributions. So it's optimal in the sense of having, I mean, this was intensively studied. Uh, and you try to pick something that balances between different distributions. By the way, if the data are normal, that's a, a, a property, at least to the way I, I describe it in the notes or in, in the slides. Um, this actually does pretty well if it's normal. I mean, normal, of course, the weights are all equal. Uh, but this bi square procedure with the constant that's in here, uh, I'll show you in a second, um, that actually is about you know, 95% efficient in the normal case. So you're not losing very much if, if you have normality by using this procedure. All right, so here, here's an example of its application fitting a line to some data. So here's, here's, uh, here's some data points and here's a line. It looks like the points are you know, pretty much wanting to go this way except for two outliers. So you do the least squares fit and by the time you get out to here, it's in no man's land. It's not near any of the points. Oops. No, that's not good. Excuse me for one second. I know we've got to quit in a second. I'll be done shortly. All right. Oh, that's interesting. All right. Um, so there's a line. So this is fitted with least squares. We get the residuals. And here are the residuals here. Here's the bi square weight function. Notice it's coming down to zero about here. So, um, you know, here, I hope you can see these points here. So residuals here. Here's the weight function. So notice that the weight is, is one at, at zero, which is right here. We get those weights, we fit a line again, you might be able to see it's moved upward because it's downweighting these more than the rest of the points, um, or most of the rest of the points. So it's actually moved up ever so slightly, might be hard to see that, uh, but if you iterate it uh, 20 times or so, it, the line just keeps moving up toward where the majority of the points go and then you have these two outliers here. So. Again, I'm not saying, you know, obviously with a set of data like this, you, you know, you go, and what you do is you say, oh, you know what, there's a problem here. What happened to these measurements? So I'm not saying you would actually do this. Again, it's for illustrative purposes. Okay. Here's the bi-square weight function. Uh, that's what it looks like. Um, 
And when you actually do the evaluation, you throw in this number six. We, won't, we don't need to talk about that. Uh, but anyway, that number determines the efficiency in the normal case. So with six, you get 95% efficiency. So all is good. So it's, a, it's an algorithm. I mean, think of this as an algorithm. That's the way I think of it. It's an algorithm that, that but you've done a lot of sort of you know, statistical thinking in, in, in the choice of the way the algorithm works. But in the end, this is an algorithm. And it's meant to be general. You hope you cover uh, a fairly wide terrain through this uh, procedure. So it's got an optimality, a kind of soft optimality, shall we say, uh, associated with it. All right, now with Lois, what are we going to do with Lois to, to, to bring by square to bear and in the lowest case? All right, so what we're going to do is this. We're going to actually do the same thing. We're going to fit Lois, you know, using the least squares formulas or, you know, least squares idea. And we're going to get residuals, and that's going to give us a robustness weight using by square. And now, when we're getting a fit at x, for each xi, yi, there'll be some weight, w sub i of x that's going to be weighting it according to how far uh, the points are from x. So you take that neighborhood weight for the ith point and multiply it by r sub i, the by square um, robustness weight, and then refit. All right, so i, wherever the evaluation is at x, the ith point is always being downweighted by r sub i. And you put the two together, and it works. Works quite nicely, actually. All right, so what about these polarization data? Let's think about this a little bit, um, then we'll quit. Um, It was certainly important to understand the patterns in the data. In this case, it was easy. We just made a scatter plot. We took a look at it. No big deal. And again, by looking at the data, we, we looked at all these lowest fits, and we said, you know what? In this case, hey, go with a spline. And we experimented by making plots of residuals to get to, um, well, let's say, we, we, we experimented and found that within the, the confines of Lois, you know, this was, the, this was the best fit. Lambda, you know, this was about the best. I mean, there's more experimentation than you see here. So this was about the best fit. But let's say that really was the right thing. You know, we're a little bit off with this, but suppose it was the right thing. You say, well, couldn't I have gotten the machine to do that? Well, yeah, that's entirely possible. There are these model selection criteria, and we could have put it into one of the criteria and varied lambda and alpha and see what gets optimized. But what are you going to do then? The well, first thing you're going to do is take that optimum value, get the residuals, and plot them up and see if it works. Because the best, the best fit from an, a model optimization criterion may be terrible. Maybe they're all awful. So there's nothing, I mean, just because you've optimized the criterion doesn't mean you've done a good thing yet. You've only done a good thing when you see that you've done, literally see, that you've done a good thing. And in this case, actually, this is an example. The optimum wasn't really quite the right thing. And um, actually, honestly, I haven't put it in a model selection criterion, but I, I'm going to guess it'll probably come pretty close to this value here. OK? All right, any, any questions, thoughts? Yeah. Yes, that's what, well, that's, that's one of 10. Sure. You know, everybody's got one. Sure. So, but in this, in this method, it almost seems like you're trying to make some judgment about fitness based just on visual inspection. Is that the case, or? Yes, to the extent that you can. And is that just from expert, uh, like expert knowledge of, the, of what you expect to be seeing, or what, what would be the criteria in that? OK, that, that's actually a very good question. There certainly is an element of yes. What, how, you know, like here, how smooth do I expect this to be? Because after all, you had the, you know, the, the one-sixth fit. I mean, it, it actually tracked the pattern nicely, but it was just too noisy. You say, well, it's hard to believe the actual response is like that. 
By the way, maybe it doesn't matter. Maybe all you need is, I'll talk about this later, maybe that's sufficient. Maybe the pictures are okay. Say, so, you know what, I don't actually need a model, uh, uh, you know, a, an actual numeric, mathematically prescribed model. The qualitative behavior is just fine for me. Forget about it. Don't, don't fit anything, please. Uh, thanks for the pictures. I'm going to go off and do some physics. Okay, I mean, I've published an article in Science on air pollution, and all we did was make a picture. And we said, wow, look at this. Uh, air pollution is actually higher on Sunday, you know, and that was it. No hypothesis test, no, no anything, you know. So, um, uh, you know, that's perfectly fine. Um, so that's one thing. The other thing is, we're, we're only, you know, all models are approximate. And, and you need to know what's good enough. And for that, you actually know, need to know something about, well, let's say, let's say statistical theory. You need to know, when am I going to get in trouble? You know, I know that if I round a lot, least squares will do actually fine. But if I have long tails, I know that's a candidate for trouble. So that, that helps you in making a judgment about, you know, when is approximation good enough? What ha I mean, it's off is, is the extent to which this thing is off going to get me in trouble. So that's one part sort of statistics, well, in machine learning, and one part subject matter. Yes? Right. Yes. Well, it depends what you mean by spline. There are, what have we done in a second? Uh, there's smoothing splines. And then there's splines where you specify knots and, and the, you know, what the polynomial is in between, and then maybe some smoothness, and, right? So there's two kinds of splines. So I, what I would have to say is that, um, especially the smoothing splines, really have behaviors that are a lot like the lowest fitting. But the lowest fitting admits of much faster computation. So what happened was, you know, when people in machine learning started to think about local learning, they looked over at what had been done and said, we can make, we can make the local fitting run really fast. And so that's that, that, what that became the consideration. Because actually, the smoothing spine is an n cubed operation. So now the spines where you pick knots, I mean, that, that's a tough procedure. And it doesn't scale too well to high dimensions. Whereas, you know, the, again, the local fitting does OK. I mean, everybody has the curse of dimensionality, right? So that's a problem. But so it just does a better job of scaling. And so it became a lot more popular. OK? Any other questions? OK, I'll tell you what. Um, we start here again later, right after the lunch? OK, let's make it 10 after 1. How about that? OK, since we, we quit 10 minutes early, let's start uh, 10 minutes late. Let's start 10 minutes late. Is that OK? <laughs>